This is Barbara Slavin. I'm at the Morris Institute Library. I'm interviewing John Inferrari for our Veterans Oral History Project. It's June 21st, 1999. Uh, just for the record, what is your name? I'm Staff Sergeant John Inferrari. And your age? And I'm 51. Okay. I'm proud of it. <laughs> and your address? Uh, Wayland. Mm -hmm. And your current marital status? I'm divorced. Do you have any children? Uh, no. I was going to ask if you have any grandchildren, but I don't think you do. <laughs> okay. Where were you born? I was born in Lennon Morse Hospital, 1948. Okay. And where were you raised? Um, Sheridan Street, right off the center oh, of town here wonderful. in Natick. Could you tell me uh, what Natick was like when you, were, when you were growing up? Well, you know, I, I've talked about this with a bunch of guys recently that I'm in the service with, and because we all come from different backgrounds. And I think Natick, out of all the towns that I've ever heard of, Natick was probably the most middle of the road, average, nice place to grow up in. It was, uh, it was a smaller town than it is now, of yeah. course, but it was uh, a great town to live in. I mean, it was, you knew everybody, um, the streets were safe, yeah. <laughs> um, there, was, there was a lot of good in this town. It was a really great town to grow up in. I really enjoyed it. And my school years were um, the same. It was uh, a great place to grow up. Uh, all my heroes were uh, uh, Mickey Mantle and Ted, Ted Williams. And, yeah. and uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful place to grow up. And uh, how would you say the town has changed since then? Well, of course, it's grown. It's grown a lot as far as population's concerned. A lot more houses. Uh, they have. Uh, a lot more, of course, there's a lot more businesses in the town as well. You know, it's, 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 it's gone up. It, it, it seems to me like it's grown about as far as it could ever grow, as far as population's concerned. I mean, there's, there's houses where I never ever thought I'd see a house. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it's grown significantly, and, uh, and it, but it's still a great town. It's still a real good town. What was your, what is your family background? Well, uh, as far as? Uh, ethnic. Ethnic background. Um, on my father's side, uh, Italian American. Mm -hmm. He's uh, my dad was born at Lennon Morse Hospital also, ah. <laughs> and my grandparents came over from Sicily around the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. um, on my mother's side, this old New England Yankee, going right back to the Mayflower. Really? Uh, my I did some research as well as as well as my grandfather, who was mm -hmm. uh, very interested in the family tree, and we found that um, the uh, uh, the family, which the, the original family name was Jennison, um, uh, my great 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 grandfather Robert O. Jennison owned a lot of what is now Kachichuit, Wayland, and even a piece of Natick. Uh, the Jennison house is still standing over on Winter Street in Natick, mm -hmm. and that's the old family homestead. Mm -hmm. And he, he must have owned, I don't know, probably six, seven hundred acres. So why land. don't you own it? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I still. Uh, the property that I own yeah. in Kachichuit is still family property from that one large parcel that uh, was given to him by King's Grant back in, I don't know, 16 something or other. I'm not sure of the date, but it's, it goes way back. Oh, uh, he did something for the king and the king rewarded him with a parcel of land and um, I, I still own the last remaining piece that's, that has any family heritage to it. Oh, it's a wonderful legacy. So, uh, yeah, it, it almost went out of the family three years ago when it went up for sale, and I bought it and, and saved it from going out of the family. So, uh, yeah, so my mother's side is old New England Yankee, as far back as you can go. So I'm a, I'm a real hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> very American. Yes, <laughs> very American. Yeah. When, uh, uh, when and where did you enter the military? Well, I graduated from Natick High in 1966 and um, wanted to go on to, uh, um, to become an aviation mechanic. Uh, the school that I wanted to go to was full at the time. They had no, no more room for new students. So I opted to go into the military and, and opted for aviation and in the military. Um, so I graduated in June of 66 um, and was off to boot camp um, August 15th uh, the same year, the same summer, as as was about half half of my class. 
So uh, um, it was, uh, I had a lot of company. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I went into the military and, uh, and went on from there. <laughs> I've so. heard that Natick is a real a military oriented town. Do you feel that way? Well, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of uh, a lot of names and a lot of plaques in this town. Yeah. So uh, I think Natick probably contributed more than its share over the years. Sure. Yeah. yeah my, my dad served in World War II, and and my dad's brother um, uh, in my family, and uh, and, the, and that's pretty much the same story of. All the guys that I went to school with, their dads served in World War II and they mm -hmm. served in Vietnam. <laughs> um, I, I was amazed to find, because I, I worked on my class reunion, uh, which was, what was it, um, a year and a half ago, uh, I was amazed to find we started doing the numbers and um, over, over half of the guys in my class served in Vietnam. So, but the timing was such that uh, when we graduated and went on to into the military, went to boot camp, got some training, and went overseas, um, we were at the pinnacle of the apex of the participation in the war. Mm -hmm. So that put our class at the probably the most participated of all the years through Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just uh, the, the numbers were just astounding. I I kept you know I kept hearing about this one and that one and that one, and not having known what had happened to them after high school. And uh, so we had many, many, many. Uh, go over uh, just a handful got wounded and as far as I know still only one one died one? Oh. in combat that's good that's low that's good and he was uh, he was in the Marine Corps uh, Keith Flamere and mm. I still pay a visit to him every time I oh. go to DC oh. <laughs> so uh, so our class was uh, they, they contributed more than more than anyone <laughs> out of the uh, those war years mm. so how did you choose the Army? Uh, well, the Army program, as far as aviation was concerned, was pretty much where I wanted to be. They, they were offering what I wanted to do, and which was I wanted to work on fixed-wing aircraft, in other words, airplanes, small airplanes, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, I, or maybe fortunately, I don't know, I, I told my recruiter, look, I want aviation, can you get me in? Uh, now, I knew what I wanted to do, and I figured just saying aviation was enough. Because they reinterpreted that because at the time they needed many, many, many more people in rotary wing uh, service than they did in fixed wing. Mm -hmm. Rotary wing being helicopters right. as opposed to airplanes. So I think it was something around my uh, sixth or seventh week of basic training, my orders came through to go off to single rotor, single turbine helicopter maintenance school. Mm -hmm. I was crushed. <laughs> Absolutely crushed. Oh. I thought they, the army had dealt me a dirty deal. Why? Well, in my mind, now again, it was in my mind. I didn't vocalize. I didn't tell anyone that I wanted fixed wing. I just said aviation. And so they, they reinterpreted that as well. We'll put them wherever we want to put them. So there it was. And I off to Virginia for, for helicopter school. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, probably it was probably my second or third week there. I thought, well, maybe this won't be quite so bad. And by the time I graduated, I was just totally sold on, on rotary wing aircraft. I thought, this, this is it. This is the way to go. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, uh, I realized that, okay, this is all right. <laughs> this is a good thing. You know, I'm going to like this. You know, it's a little, little different, and it's, it's certainly modern because it was a turbine engine helicopter, which had, up to that time, there were, there were no such things. So it was a, it was a brand, new, brand new deal. And uh, I was in this... The starting lineup, <laughs> as it were. What sort of so, engine did you say? The turbine engine. Turbine a, engine. A, a okay. uh, jet-powered helicopter, and that was a new thing back in '66. Oh, yeah. I, so. I mentioned before the interview, I had friends who tried to become helicopter pilots mm -hmm. and did not succeed. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. what qualities they look for. Well, you have to pass an aptitude test right. for before you get into flight school, and um, if they don't pass that test, they wouldn't even accept you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some people pass that aptitude test, they get on to flight school, and for one reason or another, their flying ability is not good enough to, to, to get past or whatever, mm -hmm. they end up washing out. Mm -hmm. So um, any one of those factors could, could um, keep you out of uh, a, a flight slot. So um, that's probably why. Right. <laughs> Although even as far back as, as my high school days, they were they were taking um, 
high school graduates right into the flight program as, as high school graduates in the Army. Mm -hmm. So you could go right from high school off to basic training and then right off to flight school if mm -hmm. that's what you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't looking for that myself, but that, that's, that was available to me at the time and, and still is. Still is. We've got some young kids in my unit out, on, and I'm based at Otis, by the way, out on the Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got some young kids that are just coming out of flight school now that are just out of high school. Mm -hmm. So it, you can still do that even today. And it's a great program, yeah. and it's a it's a great career. <laughs> so, did you go through the same basic training as other Army recruits, or did you go through a special no. training? No, no, so no. So was... you never went through the basic basic training that we think of as Army? No, oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Exactly the same. The same. Okay. Um, Army basic training is the same for everyone, um, just as it is the same for everyone in the Marine Corps or the same for everyone in the Air Force. Um, each what we call boot camp is, is the same for everyone. Um, the changes come after right. your, your basic training. In other words, you do your, ba your eight week, it's eight weeks in the Army. Um, I think it's something like nine weeks in the Marine Corps, um, seven weeks in the Air Force. Uh, they all vary a little bit, but they're about the same. Then you go on to your school, whatever, uh, what we call MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, whatever that's going to be, you, you, you go through that training afterwards. So you all start out the same. Mm -hmm. And that's to get your mindset on military and get you in shape if you need that. Um, and you know, just your basic soldiering skills are, are addressed first. And then you go on to your school. So, but. Um, you never get away from the platoon sergeants, and you never get away from <laughs> the uh, regiment, and uh, and you know the uh, all the the spit and polish, and you got to go through it. Yeah, that's all through the whole, your whole career. You never stop doing that. <laughs> so, did you form any uh, close friendships? Oh yeah, that was just that's probably the the best one of the better parts of the service. You, you establish some some uh, some great friends, uh, and they're all over the place, just everywhere. Um, I had, um, of course, with my unit that I was with in Vietnam, I was probably closer with them than, than anyone else because they were so, we lived, you know, we're, li we're living life in the fast lane, you know, I mean, every day was the last one, you know, and, and you just kept going and going, and uh, luckily, I, uh, I saw, luckily I made it through without a scratch, uh, but I had some, formed some great friendships. Uh, even today, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up the phone once in a while and, and, and call a couple of the guys down in Connecticut and a guy down in Florida and and uh, one out in Texas and uh, you know and they and it's just like I had you know I talked to them the day before uh, it just uh, solid friendships that last forever mm -hmm. um, and it's still the case here too I you know I have I've formed a whole new bunch of friends just this last two weeks because I just came out of the field training with an airborne unit out at Westover and uh, formed some new friendships there. As well, and uh, it's been it, it's been like that throughout my whole military career. Uh, a, a lot of a lot of the guys say I'm too much of a talker. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe someone else might, might agree with me. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, um, I I just recently gave them um, gave all the uh, the crew chiefs out at Westover because they're a sister unit of ours um, a brief talk in aerial gunnery because I'm the last, as I said mentioned before. I'm the last crew chief from Vietnam that still owns flight status in, in, in the state. Uh, that makes me a dinosaur, I guess. But uh, I gave them a brief talk on my experiences as door gunner in Vietnam. And, uh, and they were thrilled to get it because they're about to go through their, their training as door gunners. And they, uh, I guess I shed some light on them. I, I, I hope I helped them. I, I don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, friendships are developed everywhere in the military. Uh, far more friendships than enemies. <laughs> Let me say it that way. Uh, I have a platoon sergeant I don't care to don't care to run into, but that was 30 years ago, and I, so I probably won't. <laughs> now, could you tell me where your first duty station was? My first duty station was Fort Riley, Kansas. Right. The the last cavalry station in the army. <laughs> Hmm. They had the last cavalry horse there. I wow. remember seeing him, and uh, you saw him. Yeah, he was they still up. had the last cavalry horse that they um, they had. Uh, and again, it's like it's like the last battleship or the last 
uh, tank, you know, of, of its kind, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, it was an honorary position, you know, and they just, I don't think anybody even wrote him. I don't know what they did with him, but you know, I'd always, you know, would just see him in the stall there, and then, oh yeah, there's the last cavalry horse, you know. So, um, it's a, it's a very, Kansas is very flat, yeah. but a great place to fly, because you could land anywhere. It was a, you could go right down on top of the, you know, chase the wheat down as you flew down the, down the prairies, and it's a beautiful place to fly. And I trained with my unit out there um, from January of 67 until we deployed in, what was it, October of 67. So we formed up our unit, which was an assault helicopter company, and then got our orders and went overseas from there. To, um, and where did you go? Well, we, we, uh, we initially, we ended up in a small airfield just south of, oh, you guys are going to know what this place is, it, a, a place called Tuiwa. <laughs> we were in a little tiny airfield called Fu Hip and had probably enough room for our helicopters and a few more and, and we were right on the South China Sea, right on the ocean. And we were there from October until December of 67. And but, but who uh, whose island was this? Uh, excuse me. Uh, whose territory were you in when you were when you were on Fu Hip? Well, that Fu Hip was just a small coastal village. Of what country? Uh, in South Vietnam. I'm South, sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> South Vietnam. Okay. And uh, it was um, a temporary duty station for us because they they reassigned the whole company to move south about 150 miles mm -hmm. to another place called Phan Thiet. Mm -hmm. Um, Phan Thiet is a was a larger city. It had an old airstrip that was built by POW, World War II POWs, so by the Japanese, and uh, had been there for a long time. Um, an airborne unit had been there before us and had moved out, so we moved in and occupied that place. So that was that was December of '67, right? And we stayed there. Though the unit stayed there for the rest of the time that I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, although I did, um, because we all went over as a unit, they had to split us up before the end of the year. So I ended up doing a short stint with another helicopter unit out in, in a place called Ban Mutuit, which is about four miles from the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. So that was a very different experience there too. So, our, but the majority of my time in Vietnam was at this place called Phan Thiet. Another, again, another coastal city. Mm -hmm. Um, best known for its uh, the Vietnamese version of fish sauce, which is called Nut Mom, and they they make this sauce by fermenting fish <laughs> in these wooden barrels and letting the fish rot, and then they render the juice out of the f the barrel, and they make the sauce out of it. So flying over the city to come into the airfield was, let me say, not a very <laughs> pleasant experience. I got very good at holding my nose. Or, <laughs> For 45 seconds, while we went over, went over the worst part of the, uh, the, the the smell, it was just incredible, just an incredible stench. <laughs> Could you spell that uh, sauce oh, to the best gosh. of your ability, something yeah. phonetically, anyway? Let me see. It's it's pronounced Newt Mom. Newt Mob. Yeah, Newt Mom. Okay. And could you also spell the name of the city, the Phan Thiet? Phan Thiet. Phan Thiet. P H A N T H I E T. Throughout Vietnam, were you always a door gunner? Well, crew chief slash crew door chief. gunner. Okay, and what is a door and, gunner? Well, on the UH-1 um, H model helicopter that I flew on, otherwise known as a Huey, we um, our our main purpose uh, over there was to pick up troops and carry them into the wherever the wherever the battle zone was at the at the time. Mm -hmm. So we carried it um, for. For armament, we carried uh, an M60 machine gun out each door. M16 or M60? M60. M60. Okay. M60 machine gun out each door, and that was to put down suppressive fire while we were coming into land and mm -hmm. and help protect the troops as they got off board if we were taking fire. So um, a door gunner's job was pretty much a defensive role as opposed to an offensive role. Mm -hmm. We had other helicopters that. Um, Fulfill the role of offense, and they were uh, gunships. Right. Uh, but our ours were called slicks. They were 
um, just armed for defensive purposes only. And uh, that's, that was the, the role we, we took as, um, as crewmen uh, when we were doing a combat assault. Now we had other missions that didn't involve door gunnery. There would be what we used to call ash and trash, which was carrying supplies into the field. Um, we might be carrying a couple of sacks of mail to the, to the uh, infantry guys or uh, dropping off personnel from one place to another. In other words, an air taxi kind of a situation mm -hmm. or something as simple as flying up to our battalion headquarters, which is about an hour away, and picking up a, a movie for the, for the night. <laughs> something as simple as that. And uh, so we had many, many different roles and, it would, and the roles would change daily, sometimes hourly. Never knew what we we're gonna be doing next. So, um, oh, another, uh, we even acted as medevac once in a while if, yeah. if there wasn't a helicopter available for that to pick up some wounded guys and get them out of the field. And um, I remember we, we supported the Koreans, the Korean army for a while. And um, uh, not to degrade the Koreans at all, but they, they had a hygiene problem. <laughs> they would always smell of garlic and sweat. <laughs> mm. They never seemed to be very clean, mm. but they were they were real good fighters. They they really uh, they did a job. They did it well. Mm. They're good soldiers. I was not. Uh, I don't think very often think of the Koreans in Vietnam. No. Well, there were other countries there besides us, right, yeah. uh, and a lot of people forget that. Yeah. You know, there were the Koreans were there. The Australians were there. Um, gosh, who else? Um, Gee, I don't know. Well, um, uh, yeah. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if there's anyone else there. Uh, of course, we were predominant. <laughs> Naturally, we, we we did more than our share. <laughs> you mentioned was so, it the ash and trash? Did you ash say ash and trash? Yeah, ash and trash. It's, okay, it's just a, to it's try a, to get them. Then it's a yes, yeah, the an terminology a, right? Terminology right. for what we did. Our mission yeah. was you know just a. Everything and anything, okay? Another word, another saying for anything, everything and anything. We could just do whatever anyone wanted. As long as we could fit it on board and, yeah. and carry it, we'd, we'd take it. Uh, I can remember one time we picked up a, a whole big load of um, uh, plastic water jugs and we didn't have enough space. So one of us stayed behind with the second load while one went off with the, the first load. And I stayed on the ground and let the, the gunner go with the, the first load and they, I guess we had overloaded it too much because as they took off they were, they were melding all these bottles of water off the side and they, <laughs> they took off because they were falling out these big five gallon bottles of water, and, uh, the plastic jugs of water and they were splattering all over the ground. It was really funny. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> things happened. Uh, we picked up flour, sacks of flour in the field that the enemy had confiscated from the uh, peasants, mm -hmm. and I remember one time, and uh, the, the door gunner that I flew with was had, just happened to be black, young kid from um, Newark, New Jersey, and uh, one of the flower sacks had been torn in transit uh, to the aircraft. And we piled all these big 50-pound sacks of flour that we had recaptured. It was a gift of Seattle, Washington, or some mm -hmm. such sort of place, yeah. and uh, and we flew that back to a safe area and. and we landed and I went to unload it and, and grab one side to unload and, and my, my, my crewmate Donnie was this white face, all the, all the flour got all over his face and he's just totally white. It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Oh gosh, the memories, you know, the, the fun memories, that was, that, that was a good thing. You know, was, but, um, and so we would do, we'd carry every, anything, everything and anything. Uh, uh, we'd pick up weapons catches uh, that had been discovered in the ground and, uh, fly them out of the, and it would be just hundreds and hundreds of weapons stacked up and to carry them off. And uh, uh, sometimes we'd carry a USO troop out to the field somewhere to drop them off to entertain the troops. And uh, I never got to see Bob Hope. <laughs> never saw Bob. He never, never came to my area. But uh, a lot of guys did get to see him. I guess he was pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, that was the show. <laughs> So, how about uh, enemy fire? Uh, as a gunnery, as a as a gunner, did yeah. you have to defend Return yourself? Return fire, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
never got hit the entire time yeah. I was in Vietnam. I never, my, my ship never actually took any hits, oh. which is fairly amazing considering the amount of bullets fired at me. <laughs> I guess it just, the, none of them had my name on it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, uh, a lot of times you wouldn't even know you're being fired at because uh, bullets don't leave much of a mark unless it's a tracer round. Mm -hmm. um, the tracer round leaves a, it's kind of like a glow to it as it travels through the sky. But uh, a lot of times you wouldn't even know you're being fired at. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we took we'd take fire now and then going in to drop the troops off, and of course we'd we'd fire back, and uh, and just in an effort to keep that their heads down while we got our troops on the ground. Um, a, a favorite trick of theirs was to they would let us they'd let us come into a, a landing zone and drop off some of our troops, and then we'd leave with one group of helicopters. The second group of helicopters would come in to land, and then they'd open up. So now you had a mess. Mm -hmm. You had an overwhelming fire from the ground with just a few troops on the ground. So you, you, now you got a problem. Mm -hmm. and, was, and they were very adept at that. <laughs> they were like, uh, you know, they were very, very cunning. They knew how to fight a guerrilla war very well. <laughs> so, yeah, we took fire now and then. Uh, a lot of times, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, so, how far in did you fly the troops? Well. Our area of operation was in the Central Highlands, which okay. is the, the uh, kind of the middle of the country, the backbone, where all the mountains are. Mm -hmm. So we would fly them up, right up into the mountains, um, trying to chase down the uh, North Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would be, you know, we'd be, you know, quite a ways inland. Uh, we were stationed on the coast, but we'd go right, as, right, down, right out as far as the Cambodian border, as far as operations were concerned. We'd, we fly them everywhere. Uh, some of our operations would be at, oh gosh, five, seven thousand feet in the air because of the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd take them wherever they wanted to go. <laughs> Was there such a thing as a typical day in Vietnam for you? Oh, gosh. And a typical active day and a typical inactive day, let's say? Well, we, after, a, after a while, we had, we worked out a deal with the Air Force. We, we seemed to have more gun barrels than we needed, mm -hmm. and they seemed to have more stake than they needed. <laughs> so we worked out a trade with the Air Force. They needed what's called a minigun barrel. Minigun is a machine, um, a machine gun that's run by a motor mm -hmm. and has six barrels on it and fires electrically mm -hmm. and can put down 4,000 rounds in a minute. Uh, well, actually, four to six thousand if they really tweak it up. But they, these these things are amazing machines, and they they were probably the most efficient killing machine that we've ever invented, mm -hmm. other than the A bomb. It just mm -hmm. they'll they can cover every square inch of a football field in four seconds mm -hmm. with one of these things. So we um, would trade with the Air Force. We gave them some gun barrels, and they would give us steak. So every Sunday, we'd have a uh, a steak and, and beer party in the afternoon. So we that's how we knew it was Sunday. And that kind of kind of marked the end of a week. So we kind of like knew, okay, tomorrow's Monday. Yeah. And um, that's how you could tell if there was ever a normal day that was it. You know, everyone tried to make it to the to the the steak and beer party so we could uh, you know, have some uh, something decent to eat, you know, and uh, although the food wasn't all that bad. Uh, of course we had sea rations most of the time uh, in the field, which are the old rations uh, in cans, yeah. and uh, which were developed right here in Natick Labs. <laughs> and, um, and then some of the newer rations um, that were being developed at Natick Labs also, um, long range reconnaissance patrol rations, which were dehydrated food mm -hmm. that you added water to, and were absolutely out of this world. They were terrific. Uh, I understand that the Army is starting to reintroduce some of the, that type of a meal right. again uh, and it, they were wonderful. Uh, so a normal day, hard to say. Uh, sometimes it was, uh, there weren't any missions going on uh, or we had a day for maintenance stand down so we could mm -hmm. get caught up on the maintenance of the aircraft and get it cleaned up and get the guns cleaned up and that sort of thing. And sometimes there was a day we could sort of kick back and say, okay, mm -hmm. we got the rest of the day to do nothing. Uh, let's, you know, 
let's just uh, take it easy. Mm -hmm. So there were days like that. I don't remember a lot of them, but mm -hmm. every once in a while we get a day like yeah. that. Um, if we lost any crewmates, we'd have a day, uh, the, the battalion would give us a uh, stand down day. In other words, no operations that day, and, and we'd have a service pr usually at dusk mm -hmm. with a flyover with you know a couple of our aircraft, and um, the chaplain would come in and, and say a service, that sort of thing. So that would be another day that we'd have off. Or if a if a UF, if USO show came in, they'd give us a day off yeah. too. So there were different instances where we have have some time off, and uh, so it was. But it's hard to say if it was actually a normal day in a in a in a in an operation like that. It's just uh, there's just so many variables. There were so many different things going on. Uh, it seemed like one day melded into the next a lot of the time or uh, you know if we if we had any you know if we had it, uh, any ailments or anything of course we could go on sick call yeah. and get a day off that way too you know if you uh, you know if you um, you had an ailment which I did one time and I, I had this horrendous toothache I had to wait a day for the dentist to show up at our base because he made a, the rounds around different bases and uh, I remember waiting in line with this awful toothache and thinking well Finally, I'm going to get it fixed, and I'll I'll be okay. And got in and sat on the chair, and he, he says, "Well, what's the matter?" And I said, "Well, gee, I got this awful toothache, doc. It's right, right there. This tooth right here." And he said, "Well, uh, the compressor just broke, so I don't have a mach I don't have a drill, so I can't drill out the uh, the cavity." Um, <laughs> he says, "Your only option is for me to do it by hand. I've got this little hand drill here, like a." Like a, a a carpenter's hand drill, <laughs> I could probably get get enough of it out of there to yeah. to uh, at least relieve the pain. And I said, whatever it takes. <laughs> I didn't care. So he, I remember him drilling away with this thing, and uh, of course, being in such a slow revolution, I, I felt every turn of that drill <laughs> as he's going down. And uh, and then he packed it with some sort of uh, antibiotic thing, and um, and so I ended up with a hole in my tooth for the next. Well, let's see, that was probably about July, and I didn't get home here until about, what was it, uh, the end of October. So it took from July to October to get, to get that finally fixed, uh, get it filled. <laughs> so, charming. <laughs> would you, this sounds like a funny question, but would you say, when you look back, that this, that was a, a happy time in your life? Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, no. Sad? <laughs> well, it was... It was hard, it was tough losing friends. Yeah, you know, and like I said, the, the the friends I developed in Vietnam were probably closer than any of the friends I ever had anywhere else. So it was it was kind of tough when I lost right. a friend. Uh, um, gee, I remember one day we were we were in operation up in the mountains, and and there were there weren't too many other too many other guys in the unit from Massachusetts, but we had one other crew chief and one other gunner. Uh, the crew chief was Melrose. And the gunner was from somewhere on the Cape, Barnstable, I think it was. And we um, we were leaving one area to go into another to, uh, an operation, and our company had already left and started setting up the tents in this other area. And we mm -hmm. transitioned the aircraft from one field to another. And I remember taking off down the runway, and and there's there's my friend Tom. He's still working on the engine. He had the cowlings open. He was doing something. And I remember waving to him as we went by, and. Um, and about 20 or 30 minutes later, uh, I guess they, they got in the air and were en route to where we were, and we got a call that they'd gone down somewhere. And they called on my ship to go out and see if we could find them, and as all as we could find was this big pile of burning rubble. There was uh, nothing we could do, really, except send in some, uh, some troops to see if anyone had survived the crash. Yeah. And luckily, two of them had a uh, well, pilot yeah. and the gunner had survived the crash because they were on one side of the aircraft that hadn't fallen into the ground and they were both burned but they survived to uh, survive the crash mm -hmm. and one of the pilots and, and my friend Tom had, uh, died in the, in the crash and it was just a, some sort of a malfunction, we don't know, mm -hmm. yeah, we don't know what happened but they had a fire and then crashed. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so it was tough losing Tom because he was mm -hmm. One of the only other guys from Massachusetts in my unit, and yeah. that was that was tough to take. Uh, when I get back stateside here, I went to visit the family, 
and uh, his mother said, oh yes, some of the other guys had, had called to say they were sorry and um, oh, nice. offer their condolences and that sort of thing. And, and lo and behold, she said, you know, and then something that we never knew, that he had lost a brother before that in helicopters also. He never told us. Oh. So there were two, two out of one family lost in helicopters. So, uh, yeah, friendships ran deep. Yeah. Real deep. And it was always tougher when you lost someone that you knew. And as, as, the, as the months went on and, and replacements came in, it was, it was harder to try to establish a friendship because it was just easier just not to know the person. Right. Uh, and some took it as being snobbish, uh, but they just didn't understand it because they were brand new there. And it was easier just not to know them. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I remember I was transferred, as I mentioned, I was transferred my last three months over there into another unit. And it was in a place called Ban Mituit, which is all, oh, it's all rubber plantations all around it. Uh, and it's right on the Cambodian border. And I remember walking into my little, where they were gonna sign me to sleep, my little hooch, and uh, it was a tin hut. And I'm walking down the aisle looking for my bunk, the empty bunk that they had signed to me. And there's a guy, leaning back, reading a book with a big Massachusetts state flag behind his head. And I, he goes, oh, where are you from? <laughs> I go, where are you from? He says, oh, Rob Boston. I said, oh, me too. And I said, well, I'm, I'm from Natick. And he goes, oh, I guess we're not going to be friends. And I go, Framingham? <laughs> sure enough, he was from Framingham. <laughs> and of course we became fast friends and Steve was a great guy Steve he, he had been reassigned also the same deal as us uh, the idea being that when a company went over together they couldn't have us all go home together they'd have no company left so they split us into thirds mm. and kind of like reshuffled the deck and because uh, he, he was he had this other experiences like as we shared our experiences and had had a great time uh, uh, after we get out, we, we became fast friends and, and, and you know, uh, socialized uh, and I don't know where he is now. He's, he moved away to Ohio or some such way. I have lost track of him, but he was a good friend, a real good guy. It was kind of fun to see that, that state flag sitting <laughs> up there behind his bunk. Oh, gosh. And uh, good friends, a lot of good friends. Yeah. Some of them I wished I could find. I. <laughs> It's tough when all your friends are, their last names are uh, Anderson and Smith and Miller. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's real tough to find people that, with that last name. Yeah. You know? oh. When you were in the war, did you manage to keep track of the war, uh, how the war was going throughout, the, throughout Vietnam? Well, you know, we'd, oh, it, it's really hard to, for me to say because I, you know, as operations continued, um, we'd hear about things like as they were happening, mm -hmm. or sometimes the day after, which would be pretty much the same as like, stateside, I guess. Because mm -hmm. as you know, this particular war was more of a um, uh, a newsman's war where there were reporters everywhere, and we saw a lot of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would find out things that were going on over there, perhaps maybe even sooner than I did. Um, a case in point, uh, there was a um, um, that uh, the incident with um, uh, what was it uh, like Quezon, for instance. Mm -hmm. There was a big battle there at, during just prior to the Tet Offensive and, that, and carried on through. Um, hadn't heard, didn't hear a thing about that. I had no idea that that was going on because I was hundreds of miles away. Uh, fighting my own battle. Mm. So things like that we wouldn't know about until later. Uh, I'd get the hometown newspaper, I'd get the, uh, I was at the Natick Bulletin, <laughs> that would come in and uh, that was my little link with home. Mm. And uh, I, you know, and then through news through other friends would find out this, that's, this happened and that happened there. And so it was really hard to stay apprised of the situation when you're right in the middle of the whole thing. Um, we were too close to it, I guess, mm -hmm. to hear. Uh, again, when my uh, classmate, Keith Lemire, pa was killed in action, uh, I didn't hear about that for weeks because mm -hmm. I had to wait until the newspaper showed up with, with his obituary in it, and then that I knew. Mm -hmm. And I was only, 
I, as I figure, I only about maybe 150 miles away from where he was. So um, that sort of thing, of course, on a personal level, would would take longer to, yeah. to find out. What was your reaction but, to the Tet Offensive? <laughs> or how did you hear I was about scared. it? Scared. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were, as you know, they were they were trying to overtake all of the cities at the same time in a major, major operation uh, offensive. Um, so they were. We knew there was something up when, when they started to. Uh, started to assault our our airfield and positions in the broad daylight. You know, right at dawn, they were right there, and uh, throughout the whole day, there was the, the firefight going on right on our perimeter, um, right, right in broad daylight, which is unusual. Their most of their operations would take place at night, mm -hmm. uh, and it went on for days. It just went on for days, and uh, I can remember. I just happened to overhear the maintenance officer telling the operations officer, uh, well, how many aircraft have you got for us tomorrow morning? And he said, well, out of 31 helicopters, eight gunships and the rest were troop carrying version, mm -hmm. we had one gunship and four troop carrying helicopters. So out of, that was five aircraft out of 31 were flyable. So, and I remembered that thinking, wow, it can't, it can't get any worse than this, but the next day, um, the battle eased up a bit. We had a lot of Air Force support um, uh, on the outside, and um, and then our numbers came right back up uh, very quickly after that. We got more aircraft back up, and mm -hmm. and that was pretty much the end of it. So at the worst of it, yeah, it was pretty bad, but it was only a very short time, and then mm -hmm. we kind of um, you know we were able to react to what was going on, and uh, and we were okay again. And that was probably the just about the worst of it. Uh, was was a Tet Offensive, uh, except for Doc Toe, which was, which was actually that backing up. That was probably just about as bad. And that was my first uh, combat experience in, in in the helicopters uh, back in '67. Could you tell me about that? Well, that that was a a whole separate operation. And I, I from what I understand, the the Viet Cong were were testing us. Mm -hmm. They were trying out to see just how strong we were. And they tried to take over this little town and, and hilltop, and um, it's the northern northern part of the central part of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, called Doc Toe. It was a nasty place, uh, and we took a lot of casualties there. And that was my first um, real combat. That was that was pretty tough too. Mm -hmm. um, one funny note to us, and I laugh about it now because I, as I was telling you before, I. I just gave us. I gave a talk to uh, well, all the door gunners and crew chiefs out at, at Westover, our sister unit, and uh, my, I was telling them about my first combat experience. And I remember having a brief by the rest of the crew that we were definitely going to be going in hot. In other words, shooting mm -hmm. to protect these guys as we were right. taking them in. And I went all. I went through the whole drill. Got the belt loaded. Got the weapon charged and on the stand, ready to, ready to shoot once it was time to. To open up and uh, and I can remember just going in and we're you know we're probably 50 feet away from the ground and the, the pilot says okay go hot and I pulled the gun up and squeezed that trigger and nothing came out oh. and I squeezed harder I'm just squeezing the heck out of that trigger nothing's coming out and I'm going you know working the handle and thinking oh I'm gonna Harry I'm sitting here with a hunk of iron in front of me for protection <laughs> and I'm not gonna I what am I gonna do throw bullets at them or something how <laughs> <laughs> I and I remember just at the, within a second, I remembered, oh, you got to take the safety off first. <laughs> You're not going to hurt anybody with that safety on. And recovered. And it all happened within, within seconds. But it seemed like an eternity. <laughs> so that was my first combat experience. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so I can laugh about it today. Yeah, it wasn't funny wasn't at the funny. time. <laughs> uh, what would you say your, um, your biggest challenge was? Uh, in combat, in co but while staying alive, <laughs> yeah, it there was there was this ongoing perception with everyone over there. If you if you got through the first month or so over there, your chances were uh, far greater of surviving the rest of the tour. Of course, it wasn't true for everyone. There yeah. were, I've heard I heard about GIs getting killed the last day oh. of their of their year of con yeah. of, you know of do duty. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there was that perception, if you got through the first month to six weeks, 
you were okay. You know, you were, you were kind of savvy to the situation. You knew what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go, that sort of thing. And it was pretty much true. Uh, although I can remember, in retrospect, I, I took some terrible chances with myself and only thought about the chances that I had taken after, it ha after the fact. I remember uh, getting a, uh, picking up an old, uh, an old rifle in the field that was one of the, on the approved list of war souvenirs. You could take a weapon home with you, provided it was the right type of weapon. And this was an old German Mauser, World War II issue German Mauser a rifle. And it was on the list, so I said, oh great, I'm gonna take this home with me as a war souvenir. And I remember they were telling me, uh, well you have to go to this office over in the other part of the, uh, the city. Um, and I said, okay, fine, you know. So I took my rifle and I was in, I can remember I was in jeans and a t-shirt and sandals. And I'm walking down this road, looking, 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 and then finally the, the houses are dropping off to nothing. And after a few minutes I realize I'm walking down a dirt road in civilian clothes with a World War II rifle and no ammunition <laughs> and nobody around me. <laughs> and thinking, this is not a good thing. <laughs> All for a war souvenir? I don't think so. <laughs> I remember turning around and nearly running back to the airfield and saying, well, maybe I don't really want this. So what happened was I gave this rifle to a, another friend of mine who had gotten a job with the battalion mm -hmm. and had the, paper, the correct paperwork and got the weapon home. And he was being reassigned to the same uh, the same posting that I was. So he was going to give it to me when we got back to the States. So I gave this, gave the rifle to Hector, Hector Lopez, and uh, I gave it to him. Sure enough, saw him back at my next duty station, showed me the rifle, see here it is, and thinking, oh, that's great. No. And I remember going over to visit him because he was living on post with his wife, and went over to see him just before Thanksgiving. I was going to bring it home with me. I went to knock on the door and realized there's nobody there. <laughs> and he had gone home to Puerto Rico with my rifle. <laughs> so every time I run into someone I, that's from Puerto Rico, I'll say, well, are you from San Juan? And they'll say, well, so I'll more often not to say yes. I said, by any chance, do you know Hector Lopez? And they'll always laugh because there'll be, I guess in the uh, San Juan directory, there's probably 30 pages of Hector Lopez's. I said, well, He's a photographer. <laughs> oh, that probably narrows it down to about three pages. <laughs> so that was just a little thing that I, I remember, and it was, uh, you know, a chance I took that I shouldn't have taken, mm -hmm. uh, but got through it. Lived to talk about it. <laughs> oh gosh. When you were in Vietnam, were you aware of the anti-Vietnam sentiment yeah. from some Americans? Yeah. How were you aware of it? And how did you Towards feel about it? Towards the end of my, it. it it, it all changed after Tet, the Tet Offensive mm -hmm. of 68 at all. Right. And it was a very slow, insidious thing because uh, as, as opposed to stateside, I guess it, it was more, I guess it was more immediate than it was over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, by, the time I, by the time I left the country, um, we were all questioning a lot of things. Still doing our duty, but questioning why, why are we here? Why are we doing this? And why aren't the South Vietnamese army doing more? Mm. That was always the pervasive question. Why are they going home when <laughs> we're still out here <laughs> get in the rain, you know, doing their job? So there was a lot of uh, anti-war sentiment building, and I understand that it got worse after mm. I left. Uh, it got a lot worse. So. What would you say your most memorable experience was, or one of your most memorable over oh, there? Oh gosh. Mm. Um, well, as far as action is concerned, mm -hmm. I remember one night I was, I had drawn guard duty. Mm -hmm. Now, guard duty in Vietnam was, I mean, it was, um, most of the time it was pretty routine. Uh, nothing ever happened. Uh, we were in a fairly secure area where we were, we had our backs to the ocean, the South China Sea was right there. Looked a lot like Cape Cod, <laughs> as I remember. It looked like, like, like uh, Nauset Beach. And uh, I, was, I was on the bunker and it was my, my, my turn at the, 
uh, at the watch, and we'd take two-hour shifts and split it up over the night. And uh, we got a few harassment rounds from coming in, uh, mortar rounds, landing on the airfield, which happened not all the time, but every, every once in a while. They would th drop about three or four rounds, and then that would be end of it, end of the end of it, a harassment, just to, right. just to stir us up. And lo and behold, they dropped a round in, and, and they, they hit the home run, the grand slam. They landed one right in the middle of the ammo dump. Uh -huh. And the, they tell me, I didn't see it, but they tell me that they, they dropped a round in on top of 155 cannon shell cases, these whole cases of cannon shells. And uh, it was a white explosion like a small atomic bomb going off all at once. And I remember being thrown against the bunker with this rain coming down, just pieces of metal everywhere, and thinking, my God, it's the end of the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I thought the whole airfield had blown up. I was just blinded by this light. It's just incredible, incredible force. And, and it just spewed shrapnel everywhere. Uh, all the way down the flight line, it hit every one of our helicopters, blew out every window on the facing side of the explosion, and uh, we took quite a few injuries from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember a good friend of mine from Detroit, his name was John Buck, he was, he was in his cot, sleeping, when this explosion took place, and before he could get out of his cot, he was knocked out of his cot, thinking, well, what wise guy turned my cot over? <laughs> Well, the next morning we went back into his tent and it's this huge rip in the top of the tent and it was a whole half of a cannon shell, the, 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 the warhead, this hunk of iron about so, that had gone down the side of his bunk and just flipped it over. So he, he missed death by inches. Just incredible hunk of metal. I got back to my bunk and just, you know, being weary from being up all night, put my head back in the pillow and I felt this. This, this this piece of something in my pillow. So I, I turned around and I dug in the pillow and I came up with a piece of shrapnel about oh. about like so, that in a, in a hole right right over my right between my eyes. <laughs> still still got that piece of shrapnel. Oh. That's <laughs> the, the one, best souvenir. The piece that didn't get me. Yeah. <laughs> that was probably one of the scariest. So uh, it was a um, think little things like that happened. Uh, I remember my last day, my last day in country, uh, of course I was getting very nervous about getting out of there in one piece. Uh, my last night in country, uh, We're gonna and uh, I, so I remember thinking, well, I've got to get out of this place in one piece. It's, I'm down to days, and our last, my last night at my duty station, um, the NVA attacked the, uh, um, our perimeter and they, they put us all up there with, they threw me behind a 50 caliber machine gun, which I'd never fired in my entire life. <laughs> and uh, and I, I remember them coming at us and uh, um, one of the, guy, one of the um, young troops that had just been assigned there um, was in a guard tower and they shot a, 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 a handheld rocket at this guard tower and went right through the tower and didn't explode. And, and, and that young troop took out all the all of the guys that were attacking and, and all by himself, yeah. and thinking, "Boy, I, I must be living right. I'm getting out of here in one piece." You know, after all that, and the next day, I they put me on a truck and I had to drive to another airfield that was a little bit bigger than what we had, and to catch a C-130, which is an Air Force cargo plane. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving down the road and I'm just looking out the back of the truck, just watching and. There was a jeep coming the other way, and um, somebody waved at me. And uh, I thought, well, maybe it was one of my friends. I don't know. I couldn't yeah. discern who it was. Uh, so I got got back to Cameron Bay, which is where we um, caught a plane for home, and met up with all my friends that I hadn't seen in three months because we had been split up. And it was it was really great. It was like having a family reunion again. Yeah. Um, and of course, it was the last time I saw a lot of them. Uh, but it was it was that was great. So I got home, and I ran into um, uh, a girl that graduated a year after me, 
and her brother was stationed at my airfield, and I never knew it. He was in my class, um, uh, Paul Denisenzo, and you should probably call him in for an interview too, because he'll probably <laughs> okay. have a story to tell you about me. Uh, but he saw me, he recognized me, leaning my head out the back of the truck, within two or three seconds time, he recognized me and waved, and he wrote home to his sister to say, I saw John and Ferrari uh, in the back of a truck uh, at my duty station there, and uh, you know, you know, I don't know where he was going, but uh, tell him I'm here. You know, so uh, it's kind of a funny thing that uh, we just, you know, yeah. just in passing, uh, I was that close to someone, one of my classmates from high, high school here, and uh, we never even knew it. Of course, some of the some of the facilities had thousands of guys. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the benefits of being over there at the time that I was there was the fact that we had more troops on the ground than at any other point in the war. So given the numbers, I would say we were probably better off. Mm. Uh, but that was just a fun, one of those funny little things that happened. Uh, mm. So close, it's so far away. You know. <laughs> <sighs> Could you tell me, uh, were you prepared for the cultural differences that oh, sure. you find in the Army? Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, there was always the um, uh, the blacks and the whites. Uh, there was always that that you know that sort of thing. Uh, although my my crewmate was was black, uh, and we got along great. We were like brothers, yeah. just like brothers. Uh, um, but we had a lot of. Um, it seemed like a disproportionate number of blacks in the military at that time. Mm. They um, they carried the load, mm. you know, which is a disgrace for this country. Yeah. I'm sorry to say. We also had a lot of a lot of uh, minorities uh, dodging jail time. Uh, a favorite thing for judges would be to offer the military service instead of jail time. So we had a lot of crooks. Uh, I remember that. It was, you know, which in retrospect was not such a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did. I had no problem mm -hmm. with them, and um, I had. They had no problem with me. But I mean, there was that element of um, black and white, and. Um, I hate to say it, but a lot of the guys down south, they didn't like the blacks being there. Mm. And it seemed like the northerners, uh, guys from the north, got along great. It wasn't, there wasn't that antagonism, there wasn't that um, adversarial kind of atmosphere. Uh, we all got along great. So, for what it's worth. Yeah. Mm. I remember when Mar Martin Luther King was, was assassinated when we were over there. And that was a very serious time because a lot of the blacks were going to stage a protest march in Vietnam. These are regular army troops that are going to say, no, nope, we're not going to fight anymore. Uh, of course, it didn't materialize, but uh, they were very upset. Well, I was upset too. Uh, Senator Kennedy was assassinated at the same time, the same year we were over there. And again, the Vietnamese people, uh, it seemed to affect them a lot. Uh, the, the civilians that I did have contact with were, um, they were very upset that he had been assassinated. Uh, and I was surprised Kennedy or that. King? Kennedy. Kennedy. Yeah. More, well, more with Kennedy than yeah. King. Right. It seemed like one of their heroes was also gone. Mm -hmm. And um, I, was, I was surprised at that. I was surprised that they, they even knew who he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Do you have memories of the uh, the terrain and the weather? Oh, sure. What are your sure. memories? Oh, well, being stationed right on the coastline, um, I could squint my eyes and think, oh, I'm at Nauset Beach on Cape Cod. <laughs> it looked just like that. Yeah. Uh, the South China Sea was right there. It was beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Um, I can remember saying more than once, gee, it's too bad there's a war going on. This would be a great place to go for a vacation. And it was wonderful. Just wonderful. Uh, we did an operation up in the mountains at a place called Dalat. It's 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 spelled D A L A T, I believe. Mm -hmm. Dalat, Dalat, yeah. And that was a that was a small resort town up in the mountains that the French had developed when they occupied the country mm -hmm. during the their French imperial rule there, mm -hmm. and they had everything that you could ever want to find in a French village in the middle of Europe. 
I can remember clearing the mountains and looking down on this little village and thinking, well, we're not in Vietnam anymore, we're in Europe. <laughs> it looked just like a small French village. It had um, little things like a paddle pond, and uh, excuse me for my interrupt, I'm looking at one of my company helicopters flying by your window <laughs> just as we speak, one of the helicopters, so it's, it's kind of I did of that for the interview. I, I, oh, I yeah, see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm just, sorry. But they had paddle ponds, they had a, a polo field and, um, and a, a market square that looked just like something out of Europe. It's just amazing. Just amazing. And nice people, some of the, some of the best French bread I'd ever tasted. Wow. So they were all very well versed in French, which was kind of fun too. That was uh, able to use my, my limited high school French to get a loaf of bread. <laughs> <laughs> And a jug of wine. <laughs> <laughs> but they were wonderful people and, and just beautiful countryside. Absolutely gorgeous. Mm. Just, it's, as I said, it's too bad there was a war on because it's just a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, the coastline, almost all of the coastline is real pretty. Real, real pretty. Is that where the TV show China Beach was based? China Beach was way up north. That's okay. around uh, Da Nang area. Okay. No, no, that's not where I was at. Okay. Uh, I was more towards the center of the country. Mm -hmm. um, da Nang was right up near the DMZ, what we call the DMZ. Right. So that was, that was way up there now. It was <laughs> but it all looked the same. Yeah. Did you ever get near the DMZ? Or in no, the D never? No. Okay. The farthest north I ever went was Doc, the Battle of Dok Tho, okay. which was, in, again, in the fall of 67. Right. Um, that's where I got, let me see, um, I got this medal here mm -hmm. for, the, for that one. Mm -hmm. but, but this is a unit citation. Which, which the whole unit got. Right. Um, um, I'm able to still wear these medals here because I helped actually earn the medal. Mm -hmm. And this one I got for, it was Ted of 68. So that's what those are about. <laughs> Could you tell me when you um, were discharged? Uh, I was discharged in August of 69, 1969. So I did three years of um, regular army service. Mm -hmm. And what, then, uh, what stage was the war in at the time you were discharged? It's 1969, um, they were actually kind of winding down and mm -hmm. not really doing a whole heck of a lot. And a lot of the pilots that I fly with today are, are Vietnam vets from that era. And a lot of them say it was a very difficult time because everyone was trying to do their job yet stay alive at the same time. Mm. Nobody wanted to be that last soldier killed. Yeah. Uh, one of the pilots that I was flying with out at Westover was in the Marine Corps uh, during the fall of Saigon. Right. He was on the last helicopter out. He was the, literally the last yeah. person and was also, he was part of the, the basis of the, the, um, the musical Miss Saigon. They oh. took part of his story oh. and used it for Miss Saigon. So it was kind of an, he was an interesting guy. I, I remember several years ago, just as Miss Saigon was coming out, um, flipping through the channels one morning before work and seeing his face and going, wow, what's Kevin doing on TV? And then, and then he was being interviewed by someone in New York uh, about his story and, uh, and how it came about that they used part of his story for the basis of Miss Saigon. Wow. So, uh, uh, so nobody wanted to be the last one killed. You know, that, was, uh, that would have been the worst tragedy of being the last one. Could you tell me what it was like returning to uh, the United States? Uh, well, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I could just remember wanting to get home real bad. <laughs> um, I had this vision that as long as I saw the center of Natick, which I'm looking at right now, yeah. the common, I was, I was home. Yeah. And that was, that was a big thing. I can remember thinking, well, I could see the common, maybe grab a, Grab a hot dog at Casey's <laughs> Diner, then it'd be home. Yeah. You know, it was it was good good to get home. Um, like most GIs, I didn't, you know, I didn't. Um, uh, there was no band playing for me. Uh, I was going to ask about that. Yeah. How did you feel about the uh, what, what, what kind of reception home. did you get from well, your I, oh, from my, the community? My family was was glad to see me. Right. Uh, I got no no negative response from anyone. I was just glad to 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 be home and be able to put the war behind me. Uh, but so there was no negative as far as that's concerned. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any of that. All my friends were just glad to see me mm -hmm. 
Of course, my parents were thrilled to see me. Uh, I, um, <laughs> I remember my dad saying, well, well, gee, where did you get all those medals if you were if you were just a mechanic working on the helicopters, how come you have all those medals? It's like, I didn't really, I, I kind of soft pedaled the, the fact that I was flying combat missions yeah. and, and just to give him a break because he would be writing, he wrote to me every day yeah. and he'd, he'd say, well gee, you know, right where you are there's a big operation going on and boy it's a good thing that you're only only turning wrenches and, uh, and working on those helicopters because those guys are really uh, in the middle of uh, a lot of a lot of fighting going on there, and, I, and I'd write back, well, yeah, yeah, you're right, Dad, it was, you know, they, they had a tough time, and oh, by the way, I met someone from Massachusetts today, and, and I had uh, I had steak yesterday, and we're going to have ice cream today, and uh, gee, the weather's been really good lately, <laughs> so I'd have to soft pedal, and, uh, and so once I got home, I could finally tell him, that, well, gee, Dad, I didn't really turn wrenches all the time, I, I did other, st other stuff, but, but uh, it was... It was my way of dealing with my dad and just yeah. making it easier for him. But oh, God love him. He uh, he wrote to me every day, a letter a day, because he was in, well, he was in World War II and he knew the importance of getting mail. Mail was like, it was it was the saving factor, you know. And, and uh, just having a letter come in, nearly every day was was great. That was that was a good thing. Were you unique in in that respect? I don't know. Uh, did other people envy yeah, you for getting a letter every day? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so because uh, a lot of the guys were like they were. Um, they didn't have parents, or they had very few uh, family left, and so they wouldn't get as many letters. And sometimes I'd feel kind of bad about that, yeah. but uh, well, there's nothing I could do about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was lucky that way. Yeah. yeah. Looking back, how important would you say it was for you that you served in the military to you? Well, as far as an overview for the war, uh, I'd say, well, I did my duty. Right. Uh, I was called. I was, I was called to duty, and I, I did my job, mm -hmm. and I got home alive. Thank yeah. God. And I, I can only look at it that way. Yeah. And it's, how? Okay. And I, I like to think that you know, at least with the contact that I had with the Vietnamese military, the Vietnamese civilian population, the people that I talked to. Uh, I, I can only think that we were, we were helping them, and they wanted us there. Mm. Uh, the politics were, you know, I've become a lifelong student of the war, and found that no, not everything was quite up and up and above board. There was a lot of graft, a lot of corruption going on there, but that wasn't any of my doing. I had no control over that. I was there. I was in the army, and I was serving my country, and I was going to do whatever I needed to do. To do that, uh, and a lot of a lot of the other a lot of the other GIs will tell you the same thing. They may not have liked what was going on, but they did their job. How do you feel uh, serving affected the rest of your life since the military? <laughs> well, well, you're still yeah. well. I uh, <laughs> obviously I like what I do, yeah. <clears throat> and it's kind of nice to be able to fly and not get shot at. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, oh, I, it was on. I had a huge break in service, and uh, you know I was uh, effectively out of the army by 1970 because I mm -hmm. did one year of inactive ready reserve, mm -hmm. which actually counts as a as a good year. But uh, I came back into the military in 80, 85, mm -hmm. and, and, and I remember this like it was yesterday. I ran into a uh, an old friend of mine from Natick here, and and he had been in the army, uh, didn't serve in Vietnam, but he. he served in Germany and uh, I remember running into him one one night and and saying uh, oh I just re-enlisted in the Army Army Guard I said oh that's nice Steve um, what are you gonna do and he said well I'm back in helicopters uh, I can remember saying well gee there's no helicopters around here and he goes you're right there aren't any I'm stationed out in Otis on the Cape I said well gee that that sounds great what kind of helicopters they have and he said well didn't you fly on Hueys? I said, yeah. Well, that's what they got. And of course, it, spe it sparked my interest Damn. again. And uh, uh, so I can remember making a call, and it seemed like the next day I was, I was in. It, it must have been over the course of a month or two, mm -hmm. but it seemed like the next day I was back in the Army. And wow. I remember going down to the airfield to, to, just to see what it was all about. And, 
and met up with a couple of sergeants there and talked to them a few minutes and went out on the flight line just to look at the helicopters and and there was one starting up and when they start up they kick out a lot of black sooty smoke out the back and I just got a whiff of that burning jet fuel and thinking ah oh, like perfume <laughs> it's like they got me <laughs> and it's uh, it's been a lifelong love affair with helicopters even though I initially didn't start out mm. wanting helicopters I I ended up in them and it was it's been a, a good thing and here I am now we're nearing the last years of their their service and I'm still there to usher them out <laughs> so I, I have a feeling I'm gonna be I've got two years to go two more active years and I'll probably retire but uh, I'll probably be retiring with the aircraft so which is kind of interesting Excellent. the way it's all turned about yeah. Yeah. Is there a thought or a memory you'd like to f share with the community or future generations? Yeah, don't go to war. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's an awful thing and it's something that, I don't know, our history is just so steeped in, in wars. Uh, we seem to be the world's police here. And uh, if you can stay out of a war, great. But if, you're, if your country calls on you to do it, then you gotta do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, ending it on a very good note, and I want to thank okay. you for all the time. Uh, I'm glad and I your could memories. share this with you. And I thank you so oh. much for your time. Well, you're most welcome. Thank you.